I, I, I'm supposed to make introductory remarks. I'm Tony Kushner. I'm supposed to make introductory remarks. I, I, I wrote most of it down. At some point, it'll become very apparent that I'm kind of winging it. But um, the Edward M. Kennedy Prize for Drama, inspired by American history from its inception, has been in part about struggling to define things, which is to say, <clears throat> struggling to understand things, an exercise which always brings you in touch with the power of understanding and also its limits, the usefulness, indeed the necessity of attempting definitions and the impossibility of getting reality to obey one's definitions. Maybe all prizes are like that since after all, all prizes are about judging. One of our earliest and most defining and I think best decisions in creating and implementing the EMK prize through its first five years of operations was made when we were confronted with the difficulty of arriving at a definition of history. Jean Kennedy Smith, the EMK Prize's founder and the mother of us all, knew that to honor her brother's legacy of profound commitment to and engagement with the ongoing life of our democracy, this would be a prize recognizing American drama, both plays and musicals that were inspired by, confronted, addressed, uh, or addressed American history, which immediately raised the question of what history is. The decision made in that early moment was to be guided by Jean's spirit of open-hearted, open-minded, unforced generosity. The MK Prize's definition of history attempts to recognize the absurdity of attempting to pinpoint and then police the borderline between past and present. That boundary, like all boundaries, is dynamic, shifting, reformed, and remade, not just by the vicissitudes of historical events, but by, a sen by in a sense, history itself. Nothing is more susceptible to the passing of time than our relationship to time. We hope to offer our nominators and our judges a mandate to rediscover every year what history means based on what's happening in the world around them and on the materials at hand, the plays and musicals Americans have, pr have produced in any given year. I don't think it occurred to us till this year's deliberations, there was another word in the EMK Prize's expansive official title that might at some point require definition or at least the considered acknowledgement of the difficulty of defining it. We knew, what we, um, we knew that we wanted drama to include plays and musicals. Senator Kennedy, Gene explained to me at our first meeting, liked plays, but he really loved musicals. And as the recipient of last year's EMK Prize demonstrated some of the best dramatic works in American history, about American history, have been musicals. In all dramatic work, there's a complicated relationship between text and staged event. The EMK Prize is awarded on the basis of the play as text, or the musical as text and score. One of the few limits we place on our judges is a preclusion of considering production, production in judging the finalists. This year's recipient, the, a 24-decade history of American popular song, challenges all defining boundaries, including genre. It is a text, it's a, so we're, we're calling it a play. Um, I, I brought evidence. Here it is. It's 383 pages long, including the lyrics to 246 songs. Um, it's an astonishing, astonishing read, uh, as our judges discovered and as everybody on the board who had the chance to read it discovered. It was performed earlier this season once uh, for a relatively small, about 600, hardy and extremely fortunate few. When it was selected, it wasn't clear to the judges or to the board whether a 24-decade uh, history will be performed again as 24-hour 24 uh, 24 performance, whether it can be performed by others, or if the ta text will, in fact, be uh, made available to others through publication. Um, it wasn't even clear whether or not its creators considered it a text, but we did. It was only after the judges made their choices that we realized that we'd never specified in our bylaws that a recipient work needed to be performed more than once, be reperformable by other people, or be published. And on further reflection, we decided that we'd been very wise to leave out these requirements, <laughs> since it made possible bestowing this year's prize on what is an astounding text, the basis of what was clearly um, one of the great nights of theater since Judy at Carnegie Hall or Aeschylus. Um, <laughs> One of the other things that we decided early on, this was actually my campaigning, is that uh, drama critics would never be allowed anywhere near this prize not to judge it. Not, I, I, if any of you are here in the room, you snuck in and you'll be taken care of later. Um, 
But I'm going to read uh, uh, a, review, a little bit of a review. Um, uh, this is by a movie critic by Wesley Morris of the New York Times. So he's not a drama critic, so it's like one step up on the evolutionary chain. Um, <laughs> he writes, Mr. Mack gave me one of the great experiences. This is a, his review of uh, 24 decade history. Mr. Mack gave me one of the great experiences of my life. I've slept on it, and I'm sure it wasn't the physical feat. Though, come on, 246 songs spanning 240 years for 24 straight hours, including small breaks for him to eat, hydrate, and use the loo. And starting in 1776 um, uh, and ending in 2016 um, uh, with Mr. Mack all alone doing original songs on the piano and ukulele, he remembered all the lyrics and most of Walt Whitman's Song of Myself, and he sang them in every imaginable style, at every tempo, with every possible facial expression and every register of his handsome protean voice. The 24 decade project was at least in part about becoming who we want, who we Americans want to be by recognizing who we have been. It's about artistic confrontation, reinterpretation and personal transcendence. The scope of the project allows you to consider the centuries of artistic ghosts we live with. Mr. Max tagline was a radical fairy, fairy realness ritual. Off to its right was a napping loft, and at some point, sleeping bags were distributed, but a lot of us managed to, managed to stay awake for most, if not all, of this event. So if you paid the price of admission, which also seemed to include, uh, so you paid the price of admission, which also seemed to include a night of dreamlessness. That, of course, might have been the point. What if some of America's trouble is that we've been too caught up in our own individual dreams, that some dreams mean a nightmare for somebody else? What if Mr. Max Fantasia was the anti-dream, and those 24 beautiful hours were about the wisdom of staying woke. So um, we're so thrilled uh, to have Mr. Mack and Mr. Ray here uh, tonight and, and to be presenting you with the Edward M. Kennedy Prize. Um, it's now my distinct pleasure to hand the stage over to uh, two friends of mine. Um, uh, one of the traditions in presenting the Kennedy Prize. Oh. And, and then, so we're, there's a film, uh, the, 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 okay, there's a, a wonderful documentary, a little short documentary about uh, Senator Kennedy. Then, I'm flying to London right after this, I'm like not here basically. <laughs> um, then, uh, uh, because as I said, uh, Senator Kennedy really loved musicals, every year since the first year of the prize, uh, we've asked someone from uh, the theater world to come and sing. Um, uh, as part of the ceremony. Uh, about a month ago, I think a month and a half, I ran into Uzo Aduba uh, on the subway. She's an absolutely extraordinary actress. Um, many of you know her from Orange is the New Black and uh, her stage work. And uh, we met on, in the 42nd Street subway station and then I called her and asked her if she would come and do this. For some reason, I don't know why, she said yes. So she's here, and she's going to be doing the musical entertainment. Then um, my good friend and uh, one of America's uh, genuinely great novelists, Michael Cunningham, um, told me, I think, last summer that he planned to see the entire 24-hour uh, performance. I was out of town. I didn't get to see it. So I called Michael and said, you saw it. You're one of the few people that actually uh, got to. So come and talk about it. Every year we have someone speak uh, in depth about the work and Michael has agreed to do that. So now I'm gonna sit down and here's the film. That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts. Strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. For all those whose cares have been our concern, the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die.
no matter who writes the history books, when people look back on this century, they will say that Edward Kennedy was one of the ablest and most productive, most compassionate and most effective men who served in the United States Senate in the entire history of the country. My father loved this country and was fascinated by the men and women who helped to shape its history. Whenever he felt the need to better understand an issue, he often looked back to how others had solved similar problems. He loved historical documents and biographies. Their perspective helped him gain understanding, not only of their time, but of our own. Abe Lincoln was a quiet and a melancholy man. But when he spoke of democracy, this is what he said. He said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is no democracy. My grandmother, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, gave tours of her home in Hyannisport. Here is a very charming little picture of Ted with his father at the embassy, looking very serious, too. And a wonderful one of the president, late President Roosevelt. A tradition my father followed, giving tours of his office. Like grandma, he could narrate our nation's history from an extraordinary point of view. Uh, a picture of President Dick Kennedy and uh, the uh, dog tags that he was wearing in the, uh, in the Pacific. My father wanted to make history come alive. He created the annual family history camping trip. He packed up all of my cousins and took us on trips to visit famous American sites in the company of historians. Uh, Senator Kennedy has been taking his nieces and nephews and many of his family to historic places year after year. It's a wonderful family tradition. It ought to be a family tradition everywhere because those trips can change your life. He took us to Plymouth and the South Shore, the homes of Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville and the Berkshires, Paul Revere and Longfellow House, the Freedom Trail, the USS Constitution, the Brooklyn Bridge, Harper's Ferry, Manassas, Mount Vernon, Fort McHenry, and a church in Richmond. After Senator Kennedy's most recent visit, where Patrick Henry made his famous speech, uh, Ted nearly tackled me on the Senate floor the next week to tell me about it and how exciting he, it, it was to him and, and to the members of his family. He can't uh, insist that every child is going to develop a love of history or an understanding, but we sure can do everything we can to give an opportunity for the young people. His love of American history and his place in it is treasured by our family. But his contributions to celebrating and preserving our history is his lasting gift to all Americans. My brother, Edward Moore Kennedy, was the last of my mother and father's nine children. Right from the start, he captured our attention. My mother had an insatiable interest in history, literature, and the arts and she taught and quizzed each of us about what she thought was important. Mother required Teddy to memorize the poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. She felt that Longfellow's poem was a wonderful way for her children to learn about poetry and history at the same time. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. Teddy always said that early exposure to our nation's history and literature had an immeasurable impact on his life. An avid reader of biographies, he authored his own True Compass, as well as several others, including a children's book on how laws are made, as told through the eyes of his beloved dog, Splash. He admired the visual arts and was an accomplished painter who shared his work with friends and family. Music was perhaps dearest to him, a gift from our grandfather, Honey Fitz, and our mother. Uh, Ted, as you know, sings Sweet Adeline. I used to play for him on this piano.
Teddy and I shared an enjoyment of theater, especially for him, musical theater. He admired the discipline and skill that theater demanded of actors, directors, and writers. He was intrigued by the theater's creation of worlds based on the human imagination, either for the purposes of escaping what's difficult in life or for the purposes of confronting difficult truths. He loved the creative community, and the feeling was mutual. He was an ardent student of American history, and of course, he devoted his life to public service. For over 40 years in the United States Senate, he championed the role of the arts, the humanities, and the promotion of our cultural life as integral to the American experience. Teddy could have done anything with his life, and so he chose to do everything. We are all the better for it. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Ted Kennedy, Jr., and thank you so much to Columbia University and to all of you for joining in this special awards ceremony this afternoon in honor of Taylor Mack and Matt Ray um, for, their, for their performance, a 24-decade dec history of popular music, a radical fairy realness ritual. And we are so proud uh, to be here to award the 2017 Edward M. Kennedy Prize for drama inspired by American history to two outstanding artists in our country. To be honest with you, I couldn't believe my years when I heard the news that uh, that you two were going to be the award recipients this year. Um, Taylor and Matt are such unique choices uh, for this prize. Um, their selection really shatters our mental boundaries of how our country's history and culture is conveyed through artistic expression. I love the selection committee for recognizing these two amazing artists among the very accomplished group of finalists. Um, so please join me in thanking the nominators and the incredible committee that serves the, to, to award this incredible prize. Um, <coughs> so my father, my father would have loved Taylor and Matt's, uh, and Matt's edgy, uh, artistry and and their love of history and and their country, um, but I want to make a special uh, uh, tribute to my aunt Jean, who created this prize in honor of my father. Um, you know, my father was known as the Lion of the Senate and a voice of the powerless and a huge supporter, as you saw in the video, of the National Endowment for the arts, something that is under threat today. And, and um, as a fighter for social justice and for tolerance, and I'm very proud that he was one of our country's first leaders to call gay rights the final frontier of our struggle for civil rights for all Americans. Um, but thank you to Gene, um, Dad, thank, Thanks to Eugene, Dad will also be remembered as an artist and as a historian who desperately wanted to make art and history accessible to students and new um, audiences uh, who never knew that they loved history. And so he loved spending his free time with his friends who were artists and they were such great company and they reminded him to keep a perspective on everything he did with his life and, and about the things in life that were really important. Um, he loved their friendship and, uh, and they loved him. Um, so Gene, you and dad had such a special bond um, and I am so grateful that you decided to honor dad in this special way. Um, 
Now, I first met Taylor Mack. Uh, I had the privilege of attending one of his performances at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas in New Haven, Connecticut, just last year. I know that there are many people here in the audience today who came down uh, from New Haven to be part of this celebration. Um, and, uh, and Taylor premiered his, his 1990s decade uh, of the 24 decade concert of songs and, and commentary in New Haven at the festival. Now, I didn't know anything about Taylor Mack. Um, my wife usually, she was on the festival board, my wife Kiki, she gets all the tickets and she just said, you'll love the show and whatever. And I had heard that Taylor was a mu musician and a storyteller and a drag queen and I, I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and of course he appeared on stage with his band and he was wild and colorful and sparkling, sparkling makeup and body paint and wearing high heels and I almost lost my mind. Um, he, and when he said, where are my lesbians? Referring, of course, to his backup singers, I knew I was gonna be in for a very entertaining show. Um, needless to say, the performance was electrifying and provocative, and um, he's been described as a musician and a poet, and now, you are, you are gonna be known as a historian of American history. Um, so, <clears throat> I got a little nervous. I did get a little nervous when uh, he said, um, he warned the audience, this is, we come to the part in the show where um, people are gonna start walking out. And, uh, and of course, you know, I was a, at that point a newly elected official in the state of Connecticut and I turned to my wife and I said, do you think I can be seen here? <laughs> um, and, and, uh, but the, I, honestly, the experience just took all of us out of our comfort zones and stretched our minds, which is exactly what the arts should do. Um, so, um, Matt Ray, you are an incredibly accomplished musician, performer, and collaborator. Thank you, too, for bringing American history to life and for enhancing our understanding of the American experience uh, make his and making history fun, interesting, and accessible. And again, uh, to Tony Kushner, who's the spiritual head and leader of this prize in collaboration with my aunt, and all the people who are here today, thank you all for coming here and celebrating this incredible uh, celebration of my father's life and two amazing artists of our country. Congratulations, Taylor and Matt. I've been 
Riding up that lonesome road And I've seen a lot of suns going down Oh, but trust in me Ain't no low life gonna run me around No, so let me tell you something Sisters, remember your name No, twisters Gonna steal my stuff away, my sister We sure ain't got a whole lot of time I can't sing or walk in heels. Here comes the death of fun. (laughs) 
I was among the hundreds who attended Taylor Max and Matt Ray's 24 decade history of popular music, a radical fairy realness ritual, which Taylor and Matt performed for 24 hours straight in early October at St. Anne's Warehouse in Brooklyn. I can tell you that I not only stayed the entire 24 hours, but actually would have stayed longer. I can tell you that if we're all well advised to employ the phrase life-altering experience as sparingly as possible, I unhesitatingly spend one of my limited supply of that phrase on Taylor and Matt. Being present at their performance was purely and simply a life-altering experience. Now, my only problem is I've got to convey to you some sense in a relatively short period of a theatrical phenomenon that would be hard to express in, well, 24 hours. During the performance at St. Anne's, Taylor said jokingly, but more than once, this is going to go on a lot longer than you're going to want it to. <laughs> I'm no Taylor Max, still consider yourselves warned. Now, I'm going to start with, the review, with a quote from the review in The Guardian, journalists being so much better at brevity than novelists. The Guardian said, clearly, we have never been in more need of Max and Ray's radical fairy realness ritual, which, in 246 songs and 24 hours, will replace the sick, straight America we know and loathe with a deeply queer one in which outcasts and outsiders are recognized as venerated <clears throat> and venerated as visionaries responsible for creating the country's culture. Yeah, right. Um, as Taylor himself put it toward the beginning of the show, we have a lot of history on our backs and we have to figure out what to do with it. I hope you'll forgive me if I quote myself as well. <clears throat> I went to the show with five friends, and we all stayed the full 24 hours. None of us slept at all. And once I'd gotten home, I wrote a letter to the five others. I needed to preserve the experience we just shared, and I needed to address the letter to fellow witnesses. The 24-decade history had been so vast and various <clears throat> that I could feel fragments of it already sparking out along my neural pathways on the way home from St. Anne's, not because there had been any unmemorable intervals, but because the human brain, some human brains more than others, can retain only so much. I read the Guardian review before I wrote the letter. The Guardian piece was not only a brilliant appreciation, but a remarkable distillation of what had occurred during those 24 hours. And yet, as I wrote in my own letter, you know, the Cardian did a fine job of choosing examples, but there were at least a hundred other astounding moments, each of which was worth the price of admission all by itself. I realize that when I tell people about it, I'll have to edit like crazy for anybody who wasn't there, because although I'd like to tell others about all the high points, all the actual miracles, I can't really ask anyone to sit still and listen to me for as many hours as that would take. Don't worry. There were literally hundreds of climaxes, some of them performances on stage and some performances among or involving the audience. I'm not exaggerating like most novelists, I'm generally prone to exaggeration, when I say that although we surely all had favorites, there was literally not a dull moment in the entire 24 hours. Musical number by musical number, scene by scene, costume by costume, we were given a riveting, fiercely political, queer-eyed history of America, an America capable of greater ecstasies and evils than we might have imagined an America we may not have fully known we knew about until we had it tumbled out for us. 
most of the songs. Now remember, there were 246 of them. And remember, too, that Taylor was on stage the entire time and Matt for 23 of the 24 hours. We're accompanied by performances, dances, many involving members of the audience, and I'm not sure what to call them. Let's just say there was a boxing match between Walt Whitman and Stephen Foster stand-ins. There was a civil war battle fought with ping pong balls by two randomly chosen factions of the audience. At around 6 a.m., when we'd been there 12 hours, there was the sudden appearance of a marching band that paraded cacophonously up one aisle, played move on up on stage, paraded back out along another aisle, and were not seen or heard again. What of all that should you most urgently relay to the people who happen not to be there? What should you omit? <clears throat> now, The Guardian chose, quote, a naked prison sex scene that ensures that Connie Francis's Where the Boys Are will never be heard quite the same way again. <laughs> you Keep Me Hanging On by the Supremes, which in Max and Ray's version is sung by an imaginary bus of gay people going to support the civil rights movement's 1963 march on Washington brings sudden tears. Even more overwhelming is Max and Ray's take on Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, in which four audience members bear another member aloft on their shoulders, symbolizing Judy Garland's funeral. All true, all remarkable. But what about, now this is me again. What about the production of the Mikado set on Mars? <laughs> By way of taking the racism of Gilbert and Sullivan's original to its farthest and most perversely logical extreme. What about Roy Orbison's pretty woman accompanied by a phalanx of strippers, women and men, evoking the dirty glamour of the 1950s? What about the queer junior prom? When we in the audience were asked to dance with someone of our own assigned gender, while Taylor sang a swoony version of Ted Nugent's heavy metal number, Snake Skinned Cowboys, in order to, as Taylor put it, metaphorically kill the viciously right wing Ted Nugent. <laughs> what about Taylor calling the oldest audience member a man in his 80s, to the stage, and then the youngest, an 18-year-old girl, saying to the older man, start dancing, and to the girl, follow his moves. What about the fact that the older guy could really dance, and that the girl matched him, move for move? What about the heartbreaking beauty of that? There's so many more, but I'm afraid I'm wearing you out already. Taylor and Matt's show, like many significant works of art, can't really be conveyed if you weren't actually present for it. I hope that doesn't sound exclusionary. It's merely true. Most of us missed the premiere of Rite of Spring, too. And Lorette Taylor's, <laughs> and Lorette Taylor's performance in the first production of The Glass Menagerie. As I wrote to my five friends, it's as if we've been kidnapped by extraterrestrials, have returned safely to find that everyone believes our story, but no one except us was there with us. And so we encounter real limits as to how the experience can be communicated. You know, the image of kidnapped by extraterrestrials isn't such a bad one, as analogies go. Something impossible has happened to you. And although you return intact to your own zip code and your own bed, you're not quite the same person you were when you found yourself being sucked upward by a beam of light. I went out for cigarettes at some point during the night, walked about five or six blocks, and was astounded to realize that for most people it was just another Saturday night. People were going to bars, going to restaurants. It, it seemed impossible. How could they not know that a dimensional warp had opened right there in the neighborhood? 
How could they fail to know that at that very moment, mere blocks away, a troop of ukulele strumming Tiny Tims was engaged in a dance-off with a chorus of men dressed as James Joyce's Ulysses, <laughs> which was somehow convincingly part of a tribute to the over 16 million who died in World War I. <sighs> I'll stop now. If I'm the only one in the room who feels like this riff was too short, scandalously short, sketchy, embarrassingly insufficient, it's a tribute to the immense and fabulous parallel universe, the ferocious and annihilating, the gorgeous and tawdry and miraculous American dream of itself that Taylor and Matt created. As the New York Times put it, normally he's a star. This weekend, he was a solar system. I close the letter to my friends by saying, with all I've written, I'm afraid there's still something about it that can't really be explained. Not even among ourselves, or rather, at any rate, that's explaining it is beyond me. Hundreds of people felt it. I'm still recovering. Sweet dreams, my love. Blessings on us all. Finished letter, hit send. Get up from your desk and resume your slightly altered, deeply enriched life. Thank you, Taylor and Matt. Thank you, Columbia. Thank you, Ted Kennedy. Blessings on us all. On us all. Right here in this room. Thank you. This is the story of my life following Tony Gershner. <laughs> Are you interrupting me? First. No, we're, we're here. We're ready. So okay, we so just, I read this? Read this thing. You're really well organized. Uh, the Edward M. Kennedy, I think we know this. Uh, the Edward M. Kennedy Prize for Drama Inspired by American History is given annually to a new play or musical that in this theater's power to explore the past of the United States, to participate meaningfully in the great issues of our day through the public conversation, grounded in historical understanding that is essential to the functioning of a democracy. Does anybody here think that I actually wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> the Board of Governors of the Prize wants to thank our panel of distinguished judges, playwrights Amy Herzog, Robert O'Hara, Kate Moira Ryan, and Tracy Scott Wilson, playwright and librettist Kira Allegria Hudes, composer Imani Uzuri, professors Rashid Khalidi and James Shapiro, and Carol Becker, Dean of the Columbia University School of the Arts. Two pages are stuck together. Hold on. We're, we're doing so well. There. Oh, we are. There. Okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to movies. That's it. Uh, a national, okay. A national network of 20 theater professionals selected five extraordinary plays to be finalists for the 2017 Kennedy Prize. Row by Lisa Loomer, produced by Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Berkeley Rep and Arena Stage. 
a 24-decade history of popular music, a radical fairy realness ritual by Taylor Mack and Matt Ray, produced by Pomegranate Arts and Nature's Darlings, Sweat by Lynn Nottage, produced by the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. The It Gone by Kui Nguyen, produced by the South, by South Coast Repertory. And Decent by Paula Vogel, produced by Yale Repertory Theater. I'm not going to read. I, I'm not going to read the panel's decision. The prize committee has chosen Taylor Max and Mac Ray's A24 Decade History of Popular Music, a radical fairy realness. Control. As the 2017th winner of the Edward M. Kennedy Prize, a vast, immersive, subversive, audacious, and outrageous theater experience. Did you write that? <laughs> the judge is writing. The 24 Decade history employs a variety of performance technique, techniques to illumin, <laughs> illuminate and explore our country's history as seen through the lens of its popular music. This piece shows, in Mack's words, how in America the oppressor is forgiven, but the outsider is vilified. Uh, Taylor and Matt, would you please come up? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all uh, very much. Oh, thank you, yes. Um, it's a real honor that we get the prize because of the name. Um, <laughs> because uh, Ted Kennedy was a public servant and I I look to public, public servants to make my work. I'm inspired by them um, more than I am artists. Uh, and I try to make work that is uh, a public service, and um, especially in this particular piece. So that's what we, we set out to do, and um, hopefully it will uh, help inspire us to do more. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, that's all. Well, I'm I'm normally an improviser, but I felt like I wanted to write something just because I figured my mind might go blank, especially since I'm holding this check, which I'm going to hand to you. <laughs> Mostly out of fear that I might accidentally place it inside the piano or something. Um, I first met Taylor sometime in late 2008 or early 2009 when a mutual friend of ours, Rochelle Garnier, uh, called me and said, hey, uh, we're doing this reading for a new play and uh, we need someone to play piano for the, for the musical numbers in the play and I luckily was free and uh, thus began a great collaboration um, that would change my life. We, we created the L Lily's Revenge, which was a five-hour play, which somehow now seems like some kind of warm-up. <laughs> and um, and uh, we followed that up with, um, with, with touring um, a show that is a, was a cabaret show uh, that was Taylor's first ever cabaret show, I believe, because before that, you used to just do originals. And the thing about Taylor is when something catches your interest, you're hooked. <laughs> and I uh, want to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and Taylor said to me on a plane, um, I'm thinking of doing a 24-hour cabaret show. And I was like, good luck with that. <laughs> but uh, somewhere in the back of my mind, um, I knew that I was deeply, deeply interested in that. And so uh, here we are today. Um, 
I just wanted to say I have a great love for American music and also a great fascination with American history when it's removed from a paternalistic storytelling structure and instead is viewed through the eyes of the people who actually lived that history. Viewed through the eyes of people whose stories and experiences we have, we have to conjure and unearth. We aim to do that with this show. I'd like to thank uh, Ambassador Kennedy Smith, Tony Kushner of the Columbia University Libraries, the Board of Governors, and the judges for recognizing our work and for understanding that our intentions with this work were and are to create community, stimulate dialogue, and unearth things about America that we already know in our bones, but that have been forgotten, dismissed, or buried. Thank you for this prize. I'm so deeply honored, as I know Taylor is, uh, to receive this, especially since it's an award uh, with Ted Kennedy's name on it. I know I have health insurance because of that man, and um, many of us are so <laughs> grateful for the great work that he did. There's a long list of people I'm sure we could both thank, including Pomegranate Arts and, and uh, Machine Dazzle, who's here today, uh, who helped create the show with us. Uh, Nigel Smith, who's here along with, and uh, who along with Jocelyn Clark uh, hold up with us in Sundance and then went on to um, do wonderful work with us in helping shape the show. Um, I just want to say to you, Taylor, uh, it's hard to overstate how much you and this project have changed me for the better. When you work with Taylor, you learn how to trust, delegate, listen, and practice a kind of fierce flexibility. This particular project allowed me to utilize all the skills I have honed over the years being a professional musician, all at once, at all times. It was rewarding, it was awesome, and sometimes terrifying, but always deep and meaningful. You've been a collaborator, an inspirer, a dreamer, a righteous fighter, and a true friend. Thank you for trusting me, and I'm so grateful we can be up here together receiving this amazing prize. So thank you for allowing me to say that. We're going to sing a song from this show. Uh, what did I... Uh, do I want to? Okay, no, I'm just going to sing it. I'll talk in a little bit. Here we go. All alone. I'm so all alone. There is no one. Waiting for a ring, a ling, a ding. All alone in the moonlight. All alone feeling blue. One Irving Berlin wrote this song, and he grew up in the Jewish tenements in New York City. Uh, he, when he was growing up, he had people all around him at all times. Um, I hear the giggles. <laughs> um, actually, let's just listen to Matt play for a little while, and then I'll tell you.
แบบเร่ So there are people all around Irving Berlin in the tenement growing up, and then he moved away from the tenement, and he wrote a song called "All Alone," um, having lived a life where he was never alone. Uh, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to create a Jewish tenement here in Colombia. <laughs> All right. So uh, you people right here, just in this section, you're going to be the babies in the Jewish tenement. So when I go like this, you're going to go make baby noises. And if I go like this, you get louder. If I go like that, you stop. All right. Great. All right. Uh, now you guys over here. You're going to all be the the brothers and sisters at the Jewish tenement, okay? So um, you're going to be saying stuff like, "Mom, Jimmy's bugging me. Isaiah's poking me. Stop poking me. Stop, Mom, Mom, make him stop poking me." Stuff like that. You can make it up. Ready? Here we go. Do it. Go for it. When I go, yeah. If I go like that, you get louder. If I go like that, you stop. Gorgeous. Okay. You guys are going to be the neighbor kids. And the cousins that have come over, and you're saying stuff like, "Hey, hey, watch me do my eyeball trick." You're a little hyperactive, okay? So, um, you know, hey, what's going on? What's going on? Okay, you guys, go for it, go for it, go for it. Louder, louder. Okay, good. <laughs> There's a couple guys that are like, ha 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 ha. All right. So you guys over here, you're going to be the moms. Uh, right here, especially you, Ted. All right, you're gonna be the moms, and you, and because I don't do things like the heteronormative narrative, I change things up. So you're gonna be uh, watching or listen to the radio, you know, what, listen to the game. So you're, you're just, hey, where's my beer? Where's my beer? Give me my beer. Say stuff like that. Come on. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Come on. All right. Louder. Okay. Good. Now you gotta stop, Ted. When I tell you stop. Okay. Now you guys right here, you're going to be uh, the fathers. You're working in the kitchen, okay, making the meals. So you're saying stuff like, uh, like, uh, Jimmy, stop poking your sister. Isaiah, what are you doing? Stop that. What? I, what? I have to slave all day. You know that kind of stuff. Okay, ready? Go for it. Okay. Oh, good. All right. All right. Good. All right. Now, finally, you guys, you're going to be the grandmas and the grandpas. And you just complain about your ailments, so or you could just go, but or stuff like my sciatica or whatever. Okay, so here, go for it. All right, gorgeous. I love this thing where he's like, I'm reading the program, so I don't have to do it. You don't get a program anymore. All right. So we're gonna do a little practice round. I'm gonna conduct you. I'm gonna stand in the center here. All right. A little practice round. I'll conduct you, and you do your part. Woo! I might have to spend my part of the money on my broken body if I fall off. Okay. Ready? Uh, when I conduct, and don't stop until you see me go like that to your section. Okay. Here we go. Matt's just gonna play just a little bit while we do practice round. Okay, you guys got you got it. Okay, here we go, from the top. All alone, I'm so all alone. There is no one else but you. All alone by the telephone waiting for a ring a ling a ding all alone in the moonlight all alone I'm feeling blue wondering How you are, and 
if you are all alone. All alone too. Mary! Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, all you wonderful people <laughs> that I'm too embarrassed to say your names. And thank you uh, very much to our big team. You are incredible. Bye. All right. Um, that's it. We're done. Uh, I just want to read one quick thing. It's actually just one little sentence. It's from the very last page of a decade history, uh, a 24 decade history of popular music, um, uh, where uh, Taylor and Matt offer the audience, have the audience sing a, a choice, which seemed to me so perfect for the moment that we're in. Um, they, they say three times, or sing three times, lie down or get up and play, lie down or get up and play, lie down or get up and play. So I thought those were good words to end with. Thank you all for coming. Good night.